Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel 8. Douglas McGregor highlights the perilous landscape we're navigating. Currently, our economy relies heavily on a small manufacturing sector with a significant portion dedicated to military equipment production. This means military industries constitute a substantial portion of our GDP, as noted by both Blinken and President Biden. Moreover, excessive spending to maintain unnecessary global presence can draw unwanted attention, exemplified by ongoing events in Syria and Iraq. There are no missions for those soldiers on the ground over there. So what are we doing there? Well, we're magnets for attack. And one wonders whether or not this is supposed to draw us into something larger that we would otherwise want to avoid because there's just no real mission for them on the ground. Well, in the summer of 19, when the Pacific Fleet completed its exercises, which normally consisted of fighting a mock war with a fleet with an enemy that resembled the Imperial Japanese Navy, the decision was made by Franklin Roosevelt to keep the fleet in Pearl Harbor. Historically, where the fleet would come back to Pearl and then move from Pearl to their permanent berths, if you will, from Puget Sound all the way down to San Diego. And that's what the admirals wanted to do. And he said, no, we're going to leave the fleet there. And the answer that came back from the CNO at the time was, well, they're a sitting target. They could become targets for the Japanese. And the reason for that was that at the same the time that FDR wanted the fleet to remain in place, he also announced his embargo on oil and so forth. And so the fleet commander in the Hawaii was apoplectic. He said, this is wrong. You can read all of this. This is all available. And he said, we've got to get the fleet. Back home, we know the rest of the story and FDR's argument was the fleet's presence will deter anybody from attacking us. Of course, the opposite was the case. It was an invitation. I think you same thing going on today in Iraq and Syria. Yeah, I think there's a mountain of evidence to support it because the other place that everybody was looking at the time was, of course, Manila and the Corregidor. They were looking at the Philippines. For years, everybody publicly had said, oh, yes, we can defend the Philippines. But privately, everyone, including MacArthur, made it abundantly clear. So did George. Marshall, we cannot defend the place. We need to get the forces out of there. Let's make it neutral. Let's do whatever we can, but we're overreaching. We can't defend it against the Japanese. We know the rest of that. FDR was amenable to some extent if they could make the place neutral. But when it could not be made neutral in the eyes of the Japanese, he poured resources into the place to defend it. That disaster. So the Second World War for the United States opens with strategic decisions in the Pacific that were absolutely catastrophic. You have to keep in mind that large numbers of these bases are intelligence-oriented in terms of collection and surveillance. So you might want to set some of those aside because they do provide critical insights into what's happening around the world. They also provide us with support for global communications, and that's also important for our forces. But then you have large numbers of forces overseas. I don't know what it is right now. It used to be over 300,000. It may be at that point now, given all the forces we've stationed in Europe and the additional forces we've been sending over to the Middle East and the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Mediterranean. But scaling these back is something that I think is desperately needed because we live in the 21st century. This is not the 19th century. By placing someone that far forward in close proximity to a potential adversary consigns them to certain destruction. That's the problem now. It was bad in 1940 in the Philippines, and Pearl Harbor is now absolutely far, far worse. So putting them out there to begin with, in most cases, is a mistake. And all you have to do is look at the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. We just withdrawn the carrier battle group forward for many reasons. It is said, while it was scheduled to go, that may well be the case. But the logistical problem of supporting those forces at sea for months at a time is enormous. And we really weren't prepared for it in the eastern Mediterranean. And the same is true down in the Indian Ocean. You look at a place like Baja. Plain, and if you were to lose the facilities there, that would put the fleet out of business, and probably in that not just the Persian Gulf, but in the Indian Ocean as well. There just aren't that many ports that we can fall back on where we can execute the repairs and the resupply. Again, this is part of the change in warfare that we haven't come to terms with, and I hope we don't have to learn it the hard way. Well, these are the questions that President Trump asked, and I answered. We don't need to be there. I explained how long we had been in these places, anywhere from 34,050 to 70 years, including Korea and Okinawa. There was no good answer. I think a lot of it is inertia. Complacency? Well, we've been there this long. Well, what difference does it we've been there for X number of years, 
and it becomes part of the bureaucratic structure and the services. It becomes a mission factory. Now, we have something for everybody to do that we can expand the command structure, and all of a sudden, you woke up and say, well, I want you to vacate 400 of these bases overseas. And here's the list I want you to get out of. And everyone is apoplectic. You know the same thing is true in Europe, in a place like Germany. What are we doing there? Anybody who tells you that we're there to deter the Russians should immediately be dismissed and home. That's nonsense. There's nothing to stop the Russians if they want to do whatever they want to do. We found that out in Ukraine, and we're not interested in going to war with Russia. So again, what are we doing with forces there? Are we encouraging belligerence on the part of our allies, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and sometimes it looks that way? Well, that's what we've done in Ukraine, and we've gotten a half a million people killed over there. This is insane, but it's complacency, it's neglect, it's ego. Everything what we're seeing is mortgage divinity. That was the problem with the British Empire in 1946, 47. And suddenly, the Brits were told, well, we're broke. Our debt to GDP ratio is 240%. We can't maintain ourselves in India anymore. People still said, well, we've always been in India. You know what? What are you talking about? This is our country, and it wasn't their country. It was someone over this country. Well, assuming that NATO holds together between now and the election, and I don't think it's a stretch to suggest that it may not, the NATO and the EU, to a large extent, of being Trump. Filling in various ways for years now, I think NATO in particular, assuming it does survive into 2025, I would tell them that these are the terms for our continued membership in this alliance. Number 1, you're going to have to pick a four-star from the European countries to become the supreme commander of allied powers. True, too. We're withdrawing our forces. You're going to have to be your own first responder. Now we can come in and support you if you get entangled in something. Depending upon what you do, because the danger, of course, whenever a large power like the United States, commits itself to a very small power, the small power then is in charge of your military capability. That's what happened to the Tsar of Russia in 1914. He went to the aid of Serbia. It destroyed his country, and he lost the war. We don't want to go down that path, so we have to be discerning about what we will or won't do. But the first step is to say, we want to. We want to support you and assist you in whatever way we can, but we're not staying. In Europe, we're going to go home and we've got other fish to fry here, and you're going to pick somebody who's a European four-store. Now, once you say that, I doubt very seriously that the Europeans will want us to stay, to be honest. It's astonishing to me. But when you go to a place like Finland and Sweden, two places where, frankly, they should have no fear whatsoever of Russian attack, they are both hypersensitive to the possibility. Even though you point to the map and say there are no Russian forces interested in invading targeting your countries, nobody in Moscow that's even brought it up, what are you doing? And now we've already put some of our forces on the ground in Finland. And I suspect that if we're allowed to, we'll put missiles in that country, and that turns Finland into a magnet for attack because the Russians are going to sit there and feel threatened. It's stupid. I think the Poles are coming around to understanding that the Russians aren't coming. Remember the movie The Russians Are Coming? The Russians are coming. Well, I think most of the rest of them. Waking up, figuring out the Russians aren't coming. But in the meantime, the globalist elites or neocons, whatever you want to call them, continue to tell everybody, yes, the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. It's absurd. Privately, yes. Publicly, no. And they will not admit that failure, because to do so would essentially say, we are bankrupt. We never had a strategy, and they never did. There was no strategic aim. This nonsense of we're going to harm Russia, or we're going to make Russia so miserable, throw a Mr. Putin out. That was absurd. Those were just emotional outbursts. Those were not tangible concrete. Actives. Nobody said we're going to hold the line against the Russian juggernaut, which is hurtling forward. It didn't hurtle forward. It moved into the areas where the Russian-speaking population lives. It set up defenses, and the Ukrainians obliged them by hurling their forces at them, basically on our advice. We were the ones that told them about a fight. If I were a Ukrainian soldier, I'd shoot the first US or NATO officer I came in touch with. Thanks for your advice. I'll get the hell out of here. But I think they're not going to admit to doing anything wrong, as I said. Just doesn't have it in Washington. But do they know it privately? Absolutely. And the world knows that this is evidence for our weakness.